morning, Life Center. It is so good to be back with you today. Uh, I want to say just a personal note of thanks for all the prayer for myself, for our family. Uh, it is good to be out of quarantine and feel like you're back, back to life. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our family, we, uh, we had a little battle with COVID over the last couple of weeks, but uh, we've eclipsed the quarantine process, and it is good to be with you today. Amen? And uh, so, so thankful that you're joining with us, whether you're in person or online. I believe that God has a word for us today, and in a moment, we're going to go to the book of Acts chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, would love to have you go there as well. If you have the Life Center app, you can open that up. We have all the message notes loaded in there, ready for you with all the scriptures. You can follow along uh, there as well. Before I jump into the message today, I want to put something on your radar that for the second year in a row, we are doing our annual Christmas tree lighting, and this is an opportunity for us to kind of kick off the Christmas season here at Life Center, and we're doing that this Thursday. Can you say this Thursday? This Thursday night, following our Thursday evening gathering, show up for uh, just a short little time for Christmas tree lighting. We're going to have cookies, we're going to have hot chocolate, because we all know you did not get enough carbohydrates this last week. And so we want to make sure that you have everything you need to get ready for winter. Uh, so we'd love to have you join with us this Thursday night. We're going to do our annual Christmas tree lighting. It's going to be a great, great time as we kick off Christmas season here at Life Center. You know, a number of days ago, we just eclipsed a very important day in American history. In fact, the date of November 21st, 1976, is a very significant day in American history because it marked 45 years since the launch of the movie Rocky. 45 years. Let that sink in, right? 45 years from just an iconic American movie, Rocky. And one of the interesting things that I think we love about the movie Rocky, and not just the movie, but the series of movies, is the inspiration. And I want to be clear, the, the reason why we are inspired by movies like Rocky is not because the individual or the, the person in the storyline, they never experienced a challenge. No, the inspiration comes when we see somebody who hits hard times, who receives some punches from life, and yet they continue to overcome. And today, I, I have a simple message of encouragement for us as Life Center, for us as followers of Jesus, for every individual who's watching today, and it's three simple words. Get back up. Come on, can you say those three words with me? Get back up. How many know it's never too late to get back up? And in fact, I want us to turn our attention to the book of Acts. As we prepare to look at a few verses in Acts chapter 14, I want us to understand where we're at in the storyline. Acts really encapsulates the birth of the church that Jesus said he was going to set into motion. And one of the things that takes place in the book of Acts is we follow along on the storyline of a man named Saul, who eventually becomes known as the Apostle Paul. What's interesting in Acts is that Paul and his friend Barnabas, they're sent out from a church that's gathered in the city of Antioch. And this church sends out Paul and Barnabas much like we would send out missionaries. Paul and Barnabas, they go from town to town, city to city, preaching the good news about this king named Jesus who he died, but he rose again from the dead. And he is the fulfillment of all of the law and all of the Old Testament prophets. And the hope for life is found in him. In early Acts chapter 14, we see Paul and Barnabas go to a town named Iconium. And there they're preaching the gospel, they're experiencing fruitfulness in this ministry, but, but some things go sideways because do you know that every now and then there's some opponents to the gospel, there's some opposition. 
And what's interesting is that the, the people there, they come up with this strategy, let's create an opportunity to put Paul to death. And we're going to do this by grabbing rocks and stoning him. Now, I have to reference grabbing rocks because if I say let's stone him, some of us, that means something else. So I want to be clear today. They, they wanted to kill Paul. They learn about this. They flee to the next town. And guess what they begin to do? Even though they're on the run for their life, they begin to preach the gospel at this town called Lystra. And that's where we're going to find ourselves today. It's an amazing story because in the town of Lystra, Paul shows up. There's a man who's paralyzed. He can't walk. Paul brings healing through the grace of Jesus to this man, and a miracle happens, and the crowds in the town of Lystra freak out because they're assuming that their Greek gods have come in the flesh, and they, there's this frenzy. They, they begin to create plans to sacrifice in homage that the deities have arrived, and Paul and Barnabas say, hold on, time out. Time out. We are just men, just like you. We are just humans. Do not sacrifice to us. It's interesting. These people are convinced that deities have shown up. They're, they're so excited, and yet those opponents of the gospel in the other towns show up just in time for the crowd. In fact, scholars say that some of these individuals, they were Jews, they traveled over 100 miles just to create trouble. Anybody else ever experienced somebody like that? Somebody who will go to great lengths just to create a pain in the neck situation for you. And that's where we find ourselves in Acts chapter 14. Look at verse 19. It says this, some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. And, they, and when they won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was what? Dead. Thinking he was dead. After the disciples gathered around him, he got up. Come on, can you say those three words with me? He got up. Here's the crazy thing. And he went into the town. Let that sink in. Paul not only gets up, he goes right back into the city that just tried to kill him. We continue on. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. After they had preached the gospel in that town and they made many disciples, listen to this, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith. And by telling them, it is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. I want you to think about the significance of this story. Because Paul and Barnabas, all they're doing is functioning as missionaries. They're just telling people about this good news, and yet these opponents to the gospel show up, and the very crowd that was singing their praises, the very crowd that was ready to sacrifice to them moments earlier, are now ready to throw stones and kill them. Be careful the emphasis you put on the noise of the crowd in your life. Because the very crowd that might be singing your praise one moment will be ready to pick up rocks and take you out the next. Paul and Barnabas had this awareness, this conviction, and, and even though he is stoned, drug out of the city, and he is in a condition, friends, where the crowd who did the stoning assumes he's dead. But something powerful happens. What is that? Some brothers and sisters get around Paul and they pray and God strengthens Paul. He raises back up. He, he gets back up and he doesn't just get back up and say, man, these people don't like me. I'm out of here. This is not what I signed up for. Paul gets back up and goes right back in to the city into the very place 
that sought to take him out. This is amazing to me. And what does that speak to us today? Well, I believe it's important for us to recognize a church that is committed to the gospel is a church that continues to get back up. What was it that, that motivated and moved Paul to, to not only stand up and then, and then leave, but stand up and go right back in, and then the next day continue on in his assignment? There was a commitment that this gospel, this good news about a resurrected king named Jesus is real. And him getting back up is evidence. You see, a church that's committed to the gospel, it continues to get back up. Just like an individual who's been transformed by the gospel, what? They continue to get back up. And there's no lack of examples in our world right now of being knocked down, is there? See, I, I can assume that with the amount of people gathered here and watching online today, there's, there's some people who feel like life has knocked you down recently. The marriage that's experiencing fracture and pain, experiencing the painful drift of distance, of deceit, of delusionment, and, and you feel like your marriage has been knocked down. The sting of working for a lifetime towards a career only to experience the pain of being laid off or let go. The suffocating effect of isolation and loneliness that is a true pandemic reaching across the scope of our nation right now and a longing to be in community but never actually being able to find it. The ripple effects of trauma reminding us of scars and wounds that feel like they will never fully be able to heal. The integrity being called into question in our lives, feeling like, like Job, wondering if there's ever a true sense of justice in this world. See, the truth is the list could go on and on. There's no lack of examples of people feeling like life has knocked them down, circumstances have knocked them down. But here's the point. Though the pain of these situations are real, it's not too late to get back up. The pain in your marriage, the pain in your career, the, the dream or the vision that you once lived with, the, the longing for your children or your grandchildren to come back to the Lord. Understand, though things may have been knocked down, it's never too late to get back up. See, today there's a couple of truths from this scripture that I want us to, to capture in our heart. Number one is this, don't be surprised by opposition. Don't be surprised by opposition. You know, it's astounding to me at times when, when we face challenges, we wonder, where did that come from? And if we would just simply read the word, we would understand opposition is part of the journey, friends. Opposition is a part of the reality. Don't be surprised by opposition. Why? Because gospel enemies want to destroy gospel opportunities. Let me say that again. Gospel enemies want to destroy gospel opportunities. This is why there was a group of people who were opposed to the message of the gospel. They were Jews and they traveled over 100 miles just to crush the opportunity of the gospel. Why? Because they were enemies of the gospel. Understand, there are very real enemies to the gospel. There are enemies to the church. There are a very real set of enemies towards your life individually. And Paul understood that he was no stranger to opposition. Some of us, if somebody threw a rock at us, we would check out. We're like, that's it, I'm done. Do you know that's only one instance in Paul's life? Look with me to 2 Corinthians. Listen to what Paul says. 2 Corinthians, he's, he's defending, because there's, again, some opponents to the gospel. He's defending his role as an apostle. And listen to some of what Paul experienced. If you thought you had a tough week, you might want to listen up. Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one 
from the Jews. For those of you who are wondering what that is, it's where they whip your back and rip it wide open, and they do it repeatedly 39 times. Five times, not, not once, five times. Look at verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Anybody noticing a trend already? Once I received a stoning. How do we know that happened? We just read about it in Acts chapter 14. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent night and day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I've faced dangers from rivers Dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city. Anybody noticing a trend here? Dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from among false brothers, toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing, not to mention other things. But Tyler, it's so hard following Jesus. Listen, we should not be surprised by opposition. It should not surprise us as if something is going wrong. There are very real opponents and enemies to this thing called the gospel. And if we are going to be people who embody or bear the gospel, we got to understand opposition is going to happen. Not to mention other things. There is the daily pressure on me. My concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation. You look at the Apostle Paul's life here, and he understood there was, there was a dynamic at play in his life. He was aware of opposition. Why is it at times that we act shocked or surprised when we face it? Have we forgotten that we are living in the midst of an ongoing battle? That every single day you wake up and guess what? Your life, whether you want it or not, is taking place on a battlefield. There's a battlefield that we are engaged in. And we are living in the midst of that daily battle. Jesus reminded us of this in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to what? To steal, kill, and destroy. What does he want to destroy? He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your integrity and your reputation. He wants to destroy your faith. He wants to destroy the church. But guess what? A church that's committed to the gospel continues to get back up, continues to move forward. Don't be surprised by opposition. And don't think for a moment that he just simply wants to knock you down. No, he wants you to stay down. Don't think for a moment that, that he just wanted to kind of cripple the church in America by having it be closed for a few weeks. No, no, no. He wants the church to never recover. He wants to keep people in isolation. He, he wants people to draw back in their faith. Understand, he doesn't just want to knock you down. He wants to keep you down. He wants you to stay down. Why? Catch this. Because as long as you stay down, there is no testimony. There's no proof that this gospel is real. As long as Paul is laying outside of the city, as long as Paul never gets back up and goes back into the city, guess what? There's no authority in the message of this gospel. Why? Because you can preach that Jesus is alive, but if you're laying there, I see no evidence that Jesus actually is alive. But if you've been hit with stones, and somehow by God's grace, you raise back up and you walk right back into the face of opposition, there is a story that declares that thing is real. That thing is real. You see, the good news is you've been given everything you need to be victorious in the battle. Please don't miss that. Yeah, there's opposition. Yes, there's a battle. But understand, in Christ, you have everything you need. 
I am convinced that as a follower of Jesus, no matter what happens, we win. Why? Because in him, we are already alive. We've died to our old life. We've been resurrected to new life in Christ. In him, you have what you need to be victorious in the battle. Will you face opposition? Absolutely. But understand, it's three words. What is it? Get back up. Come on, say it one more time with me. Get back up. Here's the second thing I want you to know today. Just because you've been knocked down doesn't mean you have to stay down. Just because you've been knocked down doesn't mean you have to stay down. You see, knock down moments will happen. That's what opposition does. But you don't have to stay there. Is it amazing to anybody else that Paul, he not only stands up, but he goes right back into the place that was trying to kill him? Don't you think you would get the message? Okay, they don't want me there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my, my game somewhere else. But Paul, he... He stands back up and he goes right back into the place. And by the way, they thought they did what they needed to do. They assumed Paul was dead. Imagine the look on their face when they see Paul walk back into the city. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Maybe there's something to this Jesus thing. Maybe there's a different authority there that that we aren't recognizing. You see, I wonder as the rocks are being thrown at Paul, I wonder if his memory goes back to Acts chapter 9 when he was on the other side of the equation. When he was the one standing there commending the stones being thrown at Stephen, who was the first martyr that we read about. I wonder if if there was any sense in Paul's mind or imagination, the, the little whisper of the enemy saying, Paul, you deserve this. Paul, you you deserve what's happening to you right now. See, here's the key. God wasn't done with Paul. God wasn't done. And I have a conviction in my heart, guess what? God's not done with you. God's not done with your children. God's not done with your grandchildren. God's not done with your marriage. God's not done in that battle in your physical health. God's not done with what he wants to do in and through his church. God is not done. Why? Because a church or an individual that is committed to the gospel will be a church or an individual that continues to get back up. Proverbs chapter 24. Some of you, you know this scripture. It says this, verse 16, though a righteous person falls seven times, what? He will get up. He will get up. See, I I don't want to see any of the people of Life Center laying down for the count. So you got knocked down. Guess what? If you've been knocked down, you're in good company. There's a lot of people in Scripture who got knocked down. But they got back up. God's not done. God's not done with what he wants to do in and through your life. Just because you've been knocked down doesn't mean you have to stay there. It's the third thing that I want you to know today. Getting back up isn't about my strength. It's about the strength of my Savior. Getting back up is not because you are so, um, wow, look, Paul must have had some serious self-discipline. No, it, it didn't bring glory to Paul that Paul got back up. Understand this, the glory was brought to God because Paul, in the strength that God provided, was able to stand back up even though life had dealt him some blows. See, getting back up isn't about my strength, it's about the strength of my savior. See, as long as the church continues to get back up, There is a testimony that this gospel is real. But if we look around at our world and say, you know what, it's just too hard. I don't know if I want to put forth the effort. 
I don't know that community really matters that much to me because I can get what I need on my own. See, don't don't minimize the fact that when Paul was on the ground, brothers and sisters got around him and prayed. Don't miss the importance of community in the midst of get back up moments. See, Paul, he understood a thing or two about the challenge, about the battle, about experiencing those knockdown moments. And my prayer is that you or you or you or you or me, we will never experience what Paul had to experience. Amen? Do I need to read the list again? <laughs> no. But listen to what Paul says as he writes a letter to a region of churches known as Galatia. He writes this towards the conclusion of this letter. Again, understanding the purpose of writing is that false teachers, those who were opponents of the gospel, have crept in and were beginning to pollute people's faith. And this is what Paul says, Galatians chapter 16, verse 17. He says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble. Why? Because I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Woo! Imagine some people walking through the streets of Tacoma going, you know what? I've had some knockdown moments and you don't want to mess with me. Why? Because the God who's in me is greater than the God of this world. There's a reality that Paul is able to walk in in this authority. Why? Because he could look at the marks on his body. What's the point? Sometimes our scars speak. We live in a world and a culture that wants to remove scars. We want to airbrush scars. We want to pretend like there's no blemishes. But understand, sometimes the knockdown moments that you experience and the scars that you endured, what are they? The fact that you stood back up, even though there's a scar, it's a testimony. Even though I was wounded, even though there was a challenge, even though there was some opposition, even though there was a setback, the same God that got me back up is the same God who can raise you back up. Sometimes our scars speak. What do they speak to? They speak to the things that God brought us through. See, without the knockdown moment, you wouldn't know that God had the strength to get you back up. Without the pain of that moment that you never wanted to experience, but now on the other side of it, looking back and seeing the scars, you go, God, you've been faithful then, and I know you'll be faithful now. And the people around us, the family around us, the community around us, they need to understand that the message of the gospel is real. How do they know it's real? Scarred people. Scarred people who simply did one thing. Through the strength and grace of God, they got back up. They got back up. You see... Those scars are a reminder of what God brought us through. We need to never forget, sometimes God saves us from the storm, but sometimes God saves us in the storm. It's never too late to get back up. You see, it's never been about how strong you are or how strong I am. I want to remind you that Jesus doesn't need some, some strong superheroes to help him in a rebranding project. Jesus isn't looking for individuals with incredible strength. What's he looking for? He's looking for people with incredible faith. That's what he's looking for. Incredible faith. People who will not only get back up, but they'll go right back into the city right back into the face of where the challenge was. See, today, this is a message of simple encouragement. It's three words, and I hope it resonates in your heart. What is it? Get back up. Come on, would you say it with me? Get back up. Get back up. You see, the implications are real if you do not get back up. 
The implications are real for your marriage. They're real for your career. They're they're real for your witness, for your legacy, for your children, for your grandchildren. The, The implications are real. Just as they were real for Paul if Paul didn't get back up. See, don't miss this. If Paul didn't get back up, Paul doesn't make the trip to Derby. And if he doesn't make the trip to Derby, he's unable to strengthen and plant other churches and visit the churches that he's already started as he journeys back to the city of Antioch. And if he doesn't make it back to Antioch, he's not there in time for the Jerusalem Council, which, by the way, set into motion the framework of what it looks like to be a Gentile, a non-Jew who follows Jesus. And if he doesn't get back up and if he's not there in that moment, he somehow misses this opportunity to raise up this young disciple named Timothy. Because Timothy would have been reached around the point where he was stoned at Lystra. Timothy would have been somebody who who came to faith in Jesus around that moment. And now all these years later, we read Paul finding Timothy and bringing him on this next journey and Timothy becoming the elder, the head pastor in the city of Ephesus. Friends, the implications are great if Paul doesn't get back up. The implications are great if we do not get back up. You see, for Paul, his his scars would have just been scars, not a testimony of how Jesus can help you get back up. And today, I believe that God in his grace, he wants to help people get back up. Some individuals in this room, life has dealt you some challenging blows. Maybe you feel like you're in isolation. Maybe that marriage has dissolved or is dissolving. And you feel like you're on the ground. You you don't have the strength in yourself. You've said it to yourself a hundred times. I don't know if I can get up. I don't know if I can keep going, but guess what? It's not just about your strength. It's about the strength of God at work meeting you right where you are at. Today, I want us to pray. And after we pray, I'm gonna take a second to talk about some next steps. Come on, would you pray with me right now? Jesus, I pray that we would be people who would determine and commit to continue to get back up. God, help us to not be surprised when we encounter opposition, understanding that we are in the midst of a very real battle. And just because we experience moments where we get knocked down, it doesn't mean we have to stay down. So God, in your strength, not our strength, but God, in your strength, would you help us to be people who get back up? God, would you help your church to get back up? We pray for the church in America. Let it get back up. God, the church around the world globally, let it get back up. God, I pray that as we stand to our feet, it would be a testimony to the world around us that this gospel is real. Jesus, that you are good, that you can be trusted. We thank you for it. Today, maybe it's your desire to know that you have a fresh start with God. You want to know that your debt is paid, your sin is forgiven. This is your get back up moment. It's the greatest get back up moment knowing that we don't have to be defined by our sin, our shame, our separation, but through Jesus and his life, his death, his resurrection, we can be made brand new. Today, if you want that fresh start with God, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna invite you to say this simple prayer with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. I put my trust in you. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new creation and help me to follow you every day of my life. It's in your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate those who are making that decision today? Before we move on, I want to invite you to join with me in taking a next step. We do this every single weekend. So those who are in the room, if you have a smartphone, you can scan that QR code or you can open up the Life Center app. For those who are watching online right now, the team's going to put a link up 
And I want to encourage you to join with us in this. I have two simple next steps. The first one is this. For those of you who just prayed that prayer and said yes to Jesus, I want you to check that first box. And here's why. We get excited when people make a decision for Jesus, but we're passionate and committed to helping you move from that decision to walk every day with Jesus. That's called discipleship. That's what we're committed to. We want to help you in that journey. So if that's you, check that first box. Our team will follow up with you. But the second next step is this. And it's simply those three words we've repeated over and over today. It's time to get back up. If that's you in your life, there's an area where where you feel like you've been knocked down. You feel like the, the enemy has just completely obliterated your hope to even want to try to stand. But you hear today the fact that God in his grace, he wants to help you stand back up. Today, if that's you, I want you to check that second box because our team, we're going to be praying with you this week that God will continue to give you the grace and the strength to stand, that that standing would be a testimony that this gospel is real. Amen. Can I invite you to stand to your feet all across this room? Those who are at home, would you stand as well? I'm going to take a moment, pray a simple blessing over you as we're preparing to be sent from this place as well. Our pastors and prayer team will be up front at the conclusion. We'd love to be able to pray with you about anything that you're journeying through today. So Lord, thank you for your goodness in our lives. I pray that as we're sent from this place on assignment, we would leave understanding that your grace is sufficient for us. God, I thank you in advance for the get back up stories that are gonna happen in the coming days and weeks and months. God, I pray that there'd be a new testimony that would begin to circulate in our cities and in our communities, that this gospel is real and our lives are the evidence of that. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Listen, have a wonderful week. You're sent on assignment. We don't just go to church. We, we are the church, so go and be the church. God bless.